The Learning Policy Institute has been digging deep into teacher shortages over the past three years or so, um, and uh, looking in particular at the data in California to document our teacher shortages and lift that up for state policymakers. Um, we've also looked at teacher residencies and, and dug into the research on residencies and lifted that up as a strategy to both address teacher shortages, diversify the teacher workforce, and strengthen our overall teacher workforce across the state. Um, so I'm gonna share with you a little bit of that research today um, and uh, talk through um, residencies a bit. So I don't think it's a surprise to anybody in this room that we've seen a dramatic decline in teacher preparation enrollments in the state of California over more than a decade, down 73% since 2002. And so that's, you know, a major driver of our shortages in the state. Um, one of the things with statewide data is there's always a lag in the data. Uh, so we've uh, surveyed school districts. We did it in the fall of 2016 in partnership with the California School Boards Association and the fall of 2017 to get a look at uh, real-time data on how teacher shortages were affecting school districts. 80% uh, of districts last year said they were experiencing a shortage, 75% in the fall of 2016, um, and uh, these trends are continuing. Um, one of the best indicators of the teacher shortage is the issuance of emergency style permits, right? Because these are issued when districts can't find a fully uh, credentialed teacher for the position. These have increased dramatically. They're up uh, nearly 600% over the past five years. Um, and recall that these, you know, they're called PIPs and STIPs, provisional and short-term staff permits. Um, these are issued to folks who uh, haven't yet demonstrated subject matter competency uh, and often haven't yet enrolled in a teacher preparation program, and these are growing at the fastest rates across the state. So a real uh, cause for concern. Uh, teacher shortages raise real equity issues. Shelley um, talked about that at the beginning. Um, they disproportionately impact uh, low-income students and students of color. Teachers on emergency style permits are three times as common in high minority schools, twice as common in high poverty schools. Uh, and the shortage is perhaps most dramatically felt in special education, where new underprepared teachers in special education outnumber fully credentialed uh, special ed teachers by a two to one ratio. Um, and of course, these are folks teaching students with the most complex learning needs who need the most skilled and trained uh, teachers. Um, and uh, importantly, I think we need to recognize that shortages of special education teachers disproportionately impact some student groups more than others. African-American students are overrepresented in special education by 50%, English learners by 30%. Uh, half of new math and science teachers in the state are underprepared, um, and um, this is particularly troubling where we are uh, the tech capital of the world here, and yet our future um, workforce, uh, many of them are, many students in our future workforce are being educated um, by math and science teachers who are not fully trained to teach their subjects and may not even ha know their subjects well, have demonstrated subject matter competency in math and science. Uh, with the passage of Proposition 58, bilingual teacher shortages are growing. Um, so uh, Californians Together did a survey of school districts in the spring of uh, 2017. More than 50% of districts surveyed reported a shortage of bilingual teachers, and I think we're gonna hear about that from folks in San Francisco um, and how they're addressing that through their residency program later today. Um, so to, just to recap, um, the factors driving our shortage in California is this rapid decline in teacher prep enrollments. Um, districts are using their LCFF dollars to replace the courses and offerings that were cut during the recession, so um, demand has, has grown over the past several years. Uh, and then we have constant teacher attrition in the state. Um, so uh, teacher attrition accounts in California for nearly 90% of the demand for new teachers across the state. Um, and let's talk about what that, the cost that brings on school districts, right? So um, this is a tool that's on our website. It may be interesting, especially to some of you, um, district uh, 
folks here because it lets you calculate uh, the cost of teacher turnover in your district, which carries costs not just in terms of student achievement um, and school stability or the instability that high turnover carries, but also very real financial costs when you have to replace teachers who have left. That's HR costs, recruitment costs, onboarding costs, the processing costs for all of that administratively. Um, so the calculator lets you plug in the number of vacancies you had last year. I think these are Oakland's numbers. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, 400 teachers uh, that they needed to replace. Um, and if you use the, the the calculator plugs in uh, research-based estimates. Over $20,000 per teacher um, is the cost of replacing a teacher in a large urban district. That's a cost of over $8 million um, for Oakland. And so one of the things I hope we'll be able to think through today and dig into today is how might teacher residencies um, be an opportunity to reallocate some of those dollars and both retain a te strong teacher workforce over time and strengthen the workforce. Um, so over the past three years, California state policymakers have made some significant investments to address our teacher shortages, um, about $200 million over the past three years. These include programs like the Classified Staff Teacher Training Program, which is training more than 2,000 uh, new teachers in the state, paraprofessionals and teacher's aides, other classified staff. Um, many of you received integrated teacher prep uh, program grants to create or expand uh, four-year teacher credentialing programs. Um, the California Center on Teaching Careers, I think Donna Glassman Summers is going to be here later today, um, and you can ask her more about that program. But this year, there was the most substantial investment yet, $50 million in the Special Education Local Solutions Grant Program. Um, and $75 million for teacher residencies right, in STEM, bilingual, and special education. So we're going to really dig into that um, notion today um, and really get to do a lot of great learning with some of the um, uh, programs here in the room and uh, folks who've been working with teacher residencies across the country. Um, so uh, in the report that you have on your table, Patrick um, highlighted at the beginning two years ago, LPI uh, did a synthesis of the existing research base on teacher residency programs. Um, and so I want to lift up for you some of what we um, found in that research review uh, as being the, strong char the characteristics of strong teacher residency programs. The first is a very strong district and university partnerships um, that are the foundation of residency programs and really set these programs apart from other programs. Um, often residency programs also have other partners. So for example, a uh, union partner, and um, we'll hear from that partnership in San Francisco today. Often there are community-based organizations that are partners. So for example, the Los Angeles Urban Teacher Residency partners with uh, the Alliance for Better Communities and Families and Schools are key partners in that residency program. Um, but the partnership allows for the coursework and the training that residents to receive to really be responsive to local district needs and context, both in terms of the types of teachers they need to hire and uh, the, the, the quality of preparation and the types of preparation that residents receive. Uh, the coursework in teacher residency programs is tightly integrated between the clinical training that residents receive and the classes that they're taking. Often the courses are taught by folks from the school district who come in who are co-teaching with university faculty uh, or guest speakers in the classroom. Um, the courses are scheduled to make it doable for residents to work in the classroom all day and then take their courses in the evening or on Saturdays, late afternoon. Um, the residency is characterized by a full year of training, um, typically four or five days a week, um, which is really different from the traditional uh, student teaching placements. And um, the resident is typically not the teacher of record in the classroom, right? They're paired with an expert cooperating teacher who's chosen because of their experience and expertise um, and provided some compensation um, for the additional work that they're doing. Um, residency programs recruit high ability diverse candidates that are meeting those specific teacher needs. So they, district needs, excuse me. Um, and they really um, are effective at increasing the diversity of the teacher workforce. 
Uh, they provide financial support for candidates to make this level of training doable, financially doable for uh, resident teachers. So that might look like a stipend um, for residents. It might look like tuition remission or tuition support. Um, and it's tied to a teaching commitment to remain working in the school district for a certain number of years. So in the state grant program, that's a four-year uh, teaching commitment that's required. Um, and this financial component is pretty critical when you think about the debt that new teachers are entering with. The average debt um, for folks entering the field of education with a bachelor's degree is $20,000. For those with a master's degree, it's $50,000. So it's really meaningful to have that financial support. Uh, residents are placed in cohorts, which both provides them uh, support, a support network and uh, collaboration opportunities with colleagues who are going to be their colleagues in the school district the next year when they're hired. Um, and they're um, placed in teaching schools, much like medical residencies focus with the teaching hospital um, where medical residents do their training. The same is true um, in teacher residencies, and we're going to hear about that and what that looks like in San Francisco later today. Um, we talked about expert mentor teachers who are co-teaching. And finally, residency programs offer um, support and induction for residents once they graduate and are teaching in the district. So um, that might look like a, the resident supervisor then being their BITSA coach for the next two years, for example, here in California. Um, so we have a ton of great examples of residency programs in California. These are just a few of them um, in the CSU system. A number of these have partnered with the New Generation of Educators Initiative, the STAR program at CSU Domingos Hills, Kearns program with CSU Bakersfield, the RISE program with CSU Chico, uh, CSU Fresno's programs in Fresno Unified and Sanger. Um, we have residency programs partnering with uh, charter schools. So Alder is a great example of that in California. Um, in the UC system, UCLA Impacts program is partnering with LAUSD. We'll hear about that in LA for those of us who will be there later this week. And then of course the San Francisco Teacher Residency is partnering with Stanford and the University of San Francisco. So I hope we'll be able to um, look to the expertise that we have in California here with folks already um, exploring and implementing these models. Um, I talked about the impact of teacher residencies on improving retention rates. This is data from San Francisco from a couple years ago. So, um, uh, but w we see that San Francisco uh, residency program graduates, 80% of them are still teaching in the district after five years, compared to less than half of that for uh, other novice teachers hired in the district. Um, in the report, we have a table um, that lists out retention rates comparing residency program graduates to other similar graduates in the district that you can explore um, at your leisure. I won't go into it here. Um, Residency programs do show that they are effective at recruiting a more diverse teacher workforce. Um, so 45% of residents in 2015-16 were residents of color compared to about 19% of other new teachers with the most recent federal data then. Um, and residency programs really do meet those local hiring needs. I put up here the Commission on Teacher Credentialing's data dashboards. For those of you guys who haven't explored it, it allows you to see um, what those hiring needs are, are in your local district or county. For example, looking at uh, what were the numbers of PIPs or STIPs or intern credentials that were hired by subject area um, last year. So you can really look, like, look at what are the shortages that are most impacting your region. Um, so the, the RFP that you have on the table, the, the implementation has begun. The CTC's website is awesome. It has a ton of resources on it, um, in addition to the ones that Christian has put on the drive. Um, so I encourage you to dig deep into there. And they're accepting questions um, through the website or through the uh, page that Christian, the team, uh, team status check paper. Um, so submit your questions as they come up today, um, and they'll be posting responses there. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it back to Christian to introduce the panel. There we go. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tara. It's always helpful to hear um, both the research and sort of what's actually happening out there. So appreciate you being here. 
Uh, with right now, we're excited to welcome up. You've heard several times a reference to the San Francisco Teacher Residency Program, so I'd love to invite the panelists to come up here to this array of chairs over here. I think we have a um, mic for you guys. And while they're getting seated, I'll just say on a personal level, my daughter is about to graduate from college and she does want to be a teacher. So really hoping she gets some, goes someplace where there's a residency program. So I don't know if you guys are going to need her next year. She is bilingual. So, <laughs> oh, fantastic. I'll just pass that right along to her. Uh, okay, well, so just so you guys have a sense of what we're hoping that we'll be able to provide with this panel is we want to give you a deep understanding of the San Francisco Teacher Residency Program, the value it brings to the district as well as its IHE partners. So we're going to talk about both the why and the how of the program. Um, we are also going to give the audience an opportunity to answer some questions at the end. Um, so I think I'll come over here so we can have two mics over here. Here we go. Uh, and I'm going to ask if all of you guys would mind introducing yourselves and your role within the residency program. And also, if you could tell us how long you've been with the program. You want to start, Esther? Yeah. Good morning. My name is Esther Harami Yowu. I've been with the program as a cooperating teacher, as a coach. And now my current role is the clinical director. Hi, my name is Laura Hodder. Uh, I'm an adjunct professor at University of San Francisco, and I am a supervisor for science and some math teachers. I've been with the program since its inception nine years ago. Good morning. My name is Michael Essien. I'm the principal of Martin Luther King Middle School. Uh, I've been at the school for six years. SFTR has been at the school for those six years, but we've actually partnered with them uh, for like the last three years. I'm Anna Roberts. I currently teach at Martin Luther King Middle School, um, and I'm a cooperating teacher now uh, with Amy in my classroom. Um, but I also went through the program um, as a resident. Um, so I've been at the school for four years, and I was a resident the previous year. Hello, my name is Amy. I am a current resident in SFTR. I am a student teacher at Martin Luther King with my cooperating teacher, Anna. My name is Elaine Merriweather, and I'm the Executive Vice President of United Educators of San Francisco, and we have been involved since the inception of the program. Hi, good morning. My name is Brent Stevens. I'm the Chief Academic Officer with San Francisco Unified. I'm also a member of the SFTR Advisory Board. Thank you. So you can see we have a good array of roles and experience with the program, so I know you'll be getting some great information. But let's start off with talking about some of the core features of the teacher residency program. We are going to have to pass the mic back and forth if you, if you all don't mind. So Esther, maybe you could start off by talking about um, the, the length of the residency, the site partners, et cetera. Yeah. So the length of residency for us really um, actually starts in July. So our residents start with the universities, and we have two partnerships in our program. We have a partnership with Stanford and a partnership with UCS, um, excuse me, USF. And so they begin in July with their summer coursework. And that was kind of with the idea that they would be able to kind of front load a lot of the university units so that in the fall when they actually start their placements, they don't have as much of a demand on their time. And then in July, towards the end of July, our team comes together, Laura's a member of our team, and then we plan an orientation week. And orientation week is an opportunity to really get to know our residents and then to really kind of onboard them into our residency and orient them to what it means to teach in San Francisco and then to have an opportunity to really th think about like, now that I'm kind of meeting you, we've only had some opportunities to do an interview or through some email and digital conversations, but we want to get to know you to make sure that we're making the best matches possible with a cooperating teacher. So we really capitalize on this one week of orientation to get to know our residents as best we can and to go in with really well-informed decisions about where their placements will be. And then at that point, the orientation is the beginning of what we call the residency time with them because at that point, like I said, we get to know them and our teams and then we place them, we make the announcement before the end of the week about where they will be for the following year. And they already are then at that point starting an onboarding meeting with their cooperating teacher and their coaches. 
The following week is the first official week of our teachers back on contract, which is like the back to school institute time that many sites have. Our residents start with, our with their teachers at that time. So they really get the full year experience of what it's like to go into these professional development opportunities as well as doing the nitty gritty work of how to set up that classroom. What are the decisions that teachers are making when they're setting up their classrooms? So the residents really have an opportunity to start with them th from the very beginning. And then they do spend the entire year long placement with their cooperating teacher from before school started, the first day of school, through the wonderful period of the holidays, through parent conferences that happen in our district twice a year, and our residents are involved. And then through the very end, when kids are ready for that summer break, and so are teachers, and our residents take on gradually more responsibilities throughout the year. Thank you. Laura and Michael, could you talk to us about the coaching component of it? So every resident is paired with a supervisor or a coach. Uh, the role is to be a coach. And our coaches have a couple different functions. Um, we're there to meet with our residents on a regular basis. Over the course of the year, we have nine formal observations, but we're also meeting with residents on a regular basis, on a weekly basis. Um, sometimes that's in small groups, sometimes that's one-on-one, -on -one, um, where we're doing that individual coaching. Some of that might look like lesson planning, or how are you working with this student that's really troubling you? Or some of it may be, how are you holding up? You need to go, we need to go take a walk and hear some tissues, right? <laughs> uh, so there's that social emotional component as well. Um, so coaches are there to support the residents in all of their practices, both as an evaluator, but also as a, as a coach to support them in their growth. Um, the other pieces that the coaches do is we work with the cooperating teachers as well um, to try and train them to become better mentors. Um, so we're there, or sometimes in our observations, we're giving them feedback like, hmm, what kinds of questions would you be asking here? Or what, what do you think is the next step for this resident? Um, so we're trying to support our coaches as well as our, our residents, and sometimes even being a mediator between the two when those relationships hit any little rocky spots. Um, so we sort of see ourselves as being sort of deeply embedded in the schools. Um, the third piece, I think, of what we do is sort of being deeply invested in the district um, and what's going on in the district. So we're building relationships with the curriculum and instruction departments, so we deeply understand the curriculum that's going on. We try and work with our principals to um, navigate rough spots or to understand sort of what is the vision that the school is working on so that we can be supporting that in our coaching. Um, and when it comes in the time in the spring for the job search to come, you know, we're talking with our principals. Hmm, we got this good candidate here that I think would really fit your school here. And that requires a sort of a deep understanding and relationships across the district. Um, we're taking our students on rounds where we take them to visit uh, different schools across the district to say, hmm, let's look at some ideal practices um, at, uh, let's look what group work really looks like in this school, or let's look at uh, supports for English language learners at this school, and trying to give the students a sense of the different kinds of practices going on in the district. So those are some of the things that we do. And since this is a teacher residency, we're talking about teachers are being evaluated, right? So my role is like, if I'm evaluating teachers, how do I become a support for their coach who's actually supporting them in the classroom? That means how do we calibrate language, around what you're doing and supporting the teacher in the classroom. Uh, how can we tie that to uh, how we have it in San Francisco when it comes to evaluating teachers? The teachers get to choose two to three, or three to four standards they want to uh, focus in on a year. And then I get, as an administrator, I get to choose three to four. And those are the standards that we're gonna follow for the year. Well, how do we begin to hold a conversation with the coach so that we don't end up having the coach doing something that is beyond the six to eight standards and where we find that there's a burden placed upon the teacher where the teacher might be focusing in on 15 different standards as opposed to something along the lines of six to eight. Because in the end, we know that teaching is a science and an art, and so we literally have to be there to support the teacher in our development, and that means that the evaluation process has to be something in addition to the coaching. It should not be something that's actually hampering uh, the development of the teacher as we try to support them to become tenured and potentially career instructors. Great. And Esther, you have expert cooperating teachers, which we have an example of here, but do you want to talk about sort of big picture what their role is and what that looks like? 
Yeah, so in order to select them, we really go through a, a process where, again, in partnership with principals, we ask for their input. So cooperating teachers in our program aren't just someone that volunteers, but it's somebody that already has years of experience that's being recommended either through your administrator, through colleagues, and then we go to s establishing a relationship, coming into the classroom, observing, having conversations. And then at that, once they um, are able to be a part of our program, then we also compensate them for their time. We really want to value that we are asking them to take on some a heavy lift, right, of responsibility to help train our residents. And then we also help them in terms of their own professional development. Laura kind of touched bases on the informal aspect of it. We also have a structure where we offer PDs our, um, for our cooperating teachers. And so it varies year to year what type of professional development we're offering them because it really kind of depends on the needs of our cooperating teachers. So some years we have some years where we have a lot of returning cooperating teachers and then we take an inquiry based stance. And there are some years where we have some newer cooperating teachers and we're really kind of teaching them how to coach. What's the mentorship language look like? What are those stances you want to take with your resident? And then we're trying to build a community also within our cooperating teachers. Great, thanks. B before you pass off the mic, I'm gonna ask you to start and um, then Jamie, maybe you can add on, but or is Jamie here? No. Okay, well maybe somebody else will add on. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you can talk about the practicum that you have on Fridays and that cohort model that you use. Yeah. Um, so practicum is something that I highly recommend for anyone considering a residency model um, to really think about what it means to contextualize the experience for your residents in the city in direct partnership with the union and with the district and with the university partners that we have. So practicum is a structure in our program that happens on Fridays. So our residents are placed Monday through Friday at all school sites and depending on their credentialing path, they spend anywhere from beginning of the day to the end of the day or two blocks of time depending if you're in the secondary. And what happens on Fridays is that all our residents spend the morning at their placements and then they come around noon to an off-site location where we gather our entire cohort, we, which means our standard, uh, Stanford residents as well as our USF residents come to this space and we contextualize what it means to teach in San Francisco through this course. And what that looks like is, for example, we have direct partnerships with the district um, where we say, okay, what are some of the initiatives that we know that our teachers need to be really well informed, well versed, and prepared for? For example, trauma informed practices. So we partner with the district with people services, and we partner also with like UCSF, Hearts Foundation, and then we ask those speakers to come in and present to our candidates. We also do restorative practices, which is a really important component when we're thinking about the, to the students' needs in these diverse populations. So we have these opportunities throughout the entire practicum where we're thinking about partnerships, how to make sure that our teachers, our residents are gonna be well versed in what's happening. And then also thinking about how we want them to be really prepared. And Amy could probably speak about this a little bit more about what, how these courseworks and these learnings are connecting to the classroom. That's the important piece. And then this practicum piece really kind of meets some of those needs and really tries to in deep look at some of the practices that we want to be addressing. Did anybody want to add anything to that? Yeah. Amy, do you want to talk? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I attend these Friday practicums, and something that I really appreciate about the time that we spend together for three hours a week uh, is that it's never a waste of time. Like everything that we learn in this practicum period is like useful, and we can bring it to the classroom the next week. Um, for example, like learning about restorative practices and like effective language, how to like have a conversation with a student um, instead of engaging in a power struggle, like how can you frame your language so that you ask for a specific behavior um, and you know like expect high, hold high expectations without like engaging in um, antagonistic like talk. And I think that's something even as practical as that that like just giving those specific skills that we can try and uh, bring to the classroom is really important. Something else about the practicum that I really appreciate is like the cohort of USF and Stanford students that come together. Um, it's really nice because I'm one of the Stanford students, so I don't see my USF uh, fellow residents, like only that Friday that I see them. 
So it's really nice to be able to see them, and also like they are in schools that are similar to yours. And um, as a Stanford student, like a lot of my cohort members are in schools in the peninsula, and it's just a different context to be able to teach in the peninsula and to teach in an urban San Francisco setting. So it's really nice to be, have a cohort that like understands your experience, you can talk about your experiences, to have coaches that can give you advice and suggestions that um, maybe you don't, maybe I don't get necessarily at Stanford. Thank you. Laura, do you want to just r briefly talk about the link between the coursework and practice? I think we've touched on it a little bit, but if there's anything you wanted to add. Sure. Um, so our, I think one of the things that makes our residency unique is we work with two different universities, um, which creates a unique partnership because everybody sort of has a, a different lens. Um, but within that, I think there are some links that occur between the university and the work that we do. Um, when we design our practicum course on Friday, we're in constant communication with the universities to sort of understand what they're doing and what we can build on. So, oh, are you reading Freire and Zaretta Hammond in your, in your universities? We're going to build on that when we get to practicum and tie it to what's going on in the, in the classroom. Um, I'm actually the... I teach the science curriculum and instruction class at USF, and then I coach my coach the science people in the classrooms. So I have these sort of di direct links for my my people um, to sort of think about what we're doing in the classroom and how it affects your your what you're doing um, in the in your placement. Um, that also happens. You know, the math math instructor at USF is a former SFTR resident who is now teaching the math CNI there, and she and I partner together to sort of um, keep making these connections. So those connections are really important. I also work as a supervisor down at Stanford, and I'm down there on a weekly basis um, trying to make connections with their program and sort of saying, okay, what are you doing here? How can we complement it and not duplicate what you're doing, um, but complement it and contextualize it for San Francisco? Perfect, thank you. Brent, maybe you could talk to us about the financial support for the residents and um, maybe include in that a little bit about the two years of induction support. So how do we pay for all of this? Um, so so um, SFTR is now a nine-year-old program. Uh, it has, since its inception, sort of had a very diverse approach to funding. Um, so we've been leaning on, uh, over the course of this nine years, um, uh, largely federal funds that uh, came for the first several years of the grant in the form of AmeriCorps funding. Uh, we've also been relying on local funding, so SFUSD's own contribution to staff costs, um, specifically the teacher coaches and some administrators. Uh, the universities have also been contributing funding uh, since the inception that mainly takes uh, the shape of loan forgiveness or tuition remission, uh, which is significant for the residents. Uh, and then we've uh, also been successful in, in pitching and receiving a variety of grants, um, both from local philanthropies and some national level philanthropies as well. Um, we have had um, some sort of the core of our funding, the AmeriCorps funding, uh, was something that uh, uh, sort of uh, that expired two years ago. Um, we have been in the middle right now of a very difficult transition from one large funding source to another. Uh, we have that worked out. We have um, sort of successfully convinced the community of San Francisco that investing in teacher preparation is a worthwhile endeavor. And so we'll, uh, in a probably a month's time or so, shift over to a, a, a recently approved parcel tax. Uh, that will provide an on a 25-year-long tranche of funding for uh, resident stipends moving forward. Do you want to talk about the um, induction support? In sure. Yeah, so, so um, sort of simultaneous to the investments in teacher preparation, I would say that in, in San Francisco, our numbers are about 650 new teachers per year. So we've also sort of got the same issue of scale as Oakland and other large, uh, large urban districts. Um, what we've known over the course of this, this particular period of time where housing costs are going through the roof, where teacher preparation programs are not meeting the needs, that we've had to um, diversify the portfolio of programs that we're able to offer aspiring teachers. Um, so we've launched actually a number of other residency uh, programs as, as we continue to support SFTR, and then have thought about alternative credentialing programs as well, so have in fact sought authorization from CTC to be able to grant our own credentials, all while, uh, while uh, committing to the residency model. Um, at the same time, we've also invested in a large federal study of our induction program. So we accepted several million dollars in grants to, to engage in a randomized control trial of our induction programs uh, that partnered us with a local expert organization that does teach 
feature induction work, uh, and where we've looked essentially to try and make more uniform the set of high quality induction practices that all of our programs experience. Um, so that's, a, a SFTR has always envisioned that there was a, a, both the resident year and then two years of high quality induction. We've largely been following the SFTR lead across all of our induction programs. And then the other um, somewhat controversial decision that we had to make over the last three years was to ask that all of our teachers on special assignment also become induction coaches. Um, so we've had to accept that they've had reduced bandwidth in all of their content area specializations and that new teacher preparation is a priority that all of us have to hold. Uh, so by doing that, we've let some commitments go, we've, but we've also been able to get to 100% match rate between all of our new teachers and an induction coach, uh, while investing in some cases as much as eight days per year in, in induction mentor professional development. The three-year commitment, yes. Um, so, so it's been the case for SFTR that we have asked for a three-year commitment for all of our resident teachers, so that's three years of teaching in, in SFTR. Uh, you can see from our retention rates that in fact we're doing much better than that by and large. Uh, we have not ever been in the case where we've chased a resident down should, should life circumstances <laughs> you know, require them to leave San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't say that. Um, we're, no, we're, 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 not, we're not in the business of uh, sort of force, forcing people to sort of maintain a match that doesn't feel like it suits their lives or their professional commitments, but the, prof the, but the, you know, the sort of signed affirmation, the intent to work for three years, the acceptance of the money and the induction coaching, um, so far is really paying off in terms of the longevity of the residents. Uh, and then I would say, um, you know, this is also important, and Michael Essien could speak to this more, the sort of ancillary <laughs> benefits of having a team of residents located in one school location, uh, where there begins to be sort of a cohort feel beyond the residency year, I think also sort of contributes significantly to residents' commitment to their home schools. Uh, can I add one more yeah, piece yeah, to please. that, real quick? Um, also, when we're thinking about residency support and then induction support, our program really is built around this three-year model. And so in the practicum course um, that Amy and I were speaking to about, it really is an opportunity to have this community approach feel to it. And I think we all know that in terms of retention, what's very valuable is to feel supported and connected with someone. And our program is really intentional about building those relationships. So at this practicum course, while right now our numbers are lower because of the loss of funding that we've experienced, our, our coaches are attending every single Friday, even if they are not supporting a resident directly, to build that relationship because the following year, one of our teammates will be supporting them in induction. And then our team is very intentional about excuse me, what that induction support looks like. So that it is definitely a three-year commitment and it's a three-year coaching relationship specifically with someone that has known you from your pre-service year to your first two years. Our program doesn't necessarily end at after the two years. We are very intentional about building the relationships and keeping those relationships long-term. So we have one-year opportunities where we get the entire community together several times throughout the year. Perfect, thanks. But that's actually a good um, lead into hearing a little bit about what a day in your life looks like. So maybe we could hear, you guys are both at a secondary level, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe you could talk about the experience of secondary, both from a coach and a um, resident perspective. Yeah, so from the teacher perspective, um, we're both there in the morning. Um, and then it's set up so that in the secondary classroom, um, there's a primary class and then there's a secondary class. Um, and so I teach four periods of sixth grade math, and then Amy and I talked together, and we chose out of those four periods what made the most sense for, like, which period made the most sense for that to be her primary, and then which one to be the secondary. Um, and so I happened to have a prep period during third period, and so we decided to have secondary, or second period be the primary class so that we could both be in there together. Um, I could teach that one, and then Amy could um, shadow and observe and then we have third period to check in and talk through it and say like, what did you notice? What questions do you have? Let's reflect on it together and go through that reflection process as a teacher of just thinking through on the fly and kind of slowing it down of like what worked, what didn't work, what do we want to change? Um, and then Amy teaches a uh, fourth period. Um, so it's really built in as this, um, like a co-teaching model, um, which also works for the year long mentorship in terms of at the beginning, it's much more like shadowing, talking through like me just kind of breaking down like what's going through my head every moment as I'm teaching and just making that realistic and transparent. 
Um, and then as the year goes on, that fourth period becomes more and more Amy's class. So at the point now of like students know when they walk in, Amy is the teacher in fourth period. Um, then throughout the year, sh like that becomes her main class, which I think um, from what I remember of being in that role as a student teacher, it's huge to just know, um, to go through the entire process and to not only learn what that looks like from like the planning, the curriculum side of things, but just of like the building trust. What does it mean to work an entire year with that same school, with that same group of students? And I think at the end of the day, that trust is such a big piece that you miss out on if you're just going in and having a more surface level relationship in schools. So I think that that's really essential that it's a year long model um, and that she's involved every step of the way, like what Esther was saying, even from day one, um, even in the teacher meetings, Amy was there at MLK, so it was very much that she was part of that school community. Yeah, so between being at MLK and also taking graduate courses at Stanford, I'm usually at MLK around 7.45 in the morning, um, and technically I only need to be in like the secondary and primary classes, but I find that it's really useful to be at school and like to be able to observe Anna, also just to build relationships with students. And so oftentimes I will stay for homeroom, which is kind of like an advisory period just to like watch how Anna builds relationships with this one specific group of students, like what uh, community builder she does with her, with her class, um, so that I can have ideas of like when I am a teacher next year, like how can I build community? And like that's not something that's like required of me, but I think it's helpful and um, useful. And then as well as being in like first period, which is not my primary or secondary, but noticing that there are a lot of things to be learned in that period so that like uh, just having that extra time to talk to students and um, work, you know, watch and I guess navigate situations that are difficult that maybe are not as difficult in like second period or fourth period. So it's really valuable to be able to like see those situations and um, yeah, learn strategies to go about those. Um, and then as Anna was mentioning, fourth period is kind of like my period where it's like a gradual release and responsibility where at first I'm more like observing, but I know that eventually I have to take over this class so that what can I do um, to build myself up for that and also to prepare my students for that because I don't want them to like come back in January and be like, where is Miss Roberts? Um, so for sure, like being in front of the classroom so that students know who I am, uh, students can build that trust and respect and relationship with each other, me and them. Um, yeah, so starting with like leading warm-ups and then eventually like now leading the whole class, but then Anna is still there in the classroom, but starting in like January or February, like she's gonna be gone. And so that's like really exciting, but also really scary because <laughs> it's like a great opportunity to be a real teacher and like figure out those things on your own, but also having that support of being like, hey Anna, today was terrible. And like, can you give me like suggestions on like what to do better? Um, but knowing that with knowing that you are in front of the class and you are doing everything, you're planning the lesson, you are um, teaching the class, but also like you have somebody to fall back on and um, yeah, like support you mentally, emotionally, uh, so that you don't burn out and that you like know that it is hard work, but you are doing like these are things that you're doing well. These are things that you can improve on. Great, thanks. I think um, maybe Esther, you could talk to us then a little bit about the life of the elementary coach. Uh, as they were specifically referring to the secondary, in elementary, um, our residents are basically there from the start of the day before school starts to the very end. And so their model looks a little different in terms of gradual release of responsibility. So our, resident, our program is a big believer, as most of you are, I'm sure, in co-teaching models. And so we really talk to our cooperating teachers about what does that look like and which are the best ones at various points of the year. And so in elementary, there's very much of like one teach, one observe, and then there's small group work where they're doing some parallel teaching. Once it goes beyond that then, we ask our cooperating teachers to really start to be very thoughtful about integrating our um, candidates, our residents, into their teaching spaces much more thoughtfully. And also very contingent upon their development. I think it's very crucial to understand because some of our residents come with a wealth of experience working in after school programs or having come as part of a dual degree program. And some of our residents have fewer touch points with students. And so we want to be very cognizant of that as we're thinking about what their learning is going to look like for the trajectory of the year. 
And in an elementary context, by November, December, they take a full um, day of instruction, a solo day. But we've put in a lot of legwork around a solo day progression to see what that looks like, back-to-back -back lessons, transitions, half days, mornings, half day afternoons. And so there's a lot of stamina building. When we come back from the winter break in January, again, there's some coaching structures that are put in place so that our elementary residents can now take on two back-to-back -back days. That leads them into a full one-week experience of teaching with the support of cooperating teacher and their coach. And then by around April, March, April, May, depending on the resident's development, they take on two full weeks of solo teaching. And by the two full weeks experience, they are the ones who are planning day to day everything that happens. So the cooperating teacher is still supportive. It's not like we ask our cooperative teachers, this is your time for Manny Petty, you can leave school. <laughs> it is very still intentional around that you're popping in and out, but creating much more space to give them the authentic experience that they need and knowing how to make those adjustments in their instruction from one day to the next. Great, thank you. I want to switch a little bit to internal partnerships. So I'd love to have Elaine, if you could talk about from the union's perspective, um, th your role and um, Brent also talking, maybe the two of you could address how the partnership came to be and why are you both continuing it? What are you guys getting out of it? Yeah. So <clears throat> I'll go first. Um, so when we first got started, I think it was in 2010, um, at that time, the president was um, Dennis Kelly, and um, he was excited about, one of the principals came and talked to him about the program, and he was very excited about it. And so th it started with just meeting about it, and then, you know, it got going. But um, unions have always had a tradition in apprenticeships, so it seemed natural for us to be a part of this. And so um, we jump right on board and start working with the district and the partners. And um, we knew that this would be something good. For a long time, um, we had trouble retaining teachers as well. And so um, we would get TFAs. And so we wanted to move away from that and just grow our own teachers. And so this was like the perfect program for, for that. And so um, that's how we started. And then um, four years later, we did apply for a grant because we belong to affiliates, the state affiliate and the national affiliate. So we was able to secure funding. We applied for a grant through the National Education Association to you know, support the program. And so we did get a grant for over $534,000. So we were able to directly support this program, and so um, it's all about the children. This, the children is at the center, and um, this students getting that quality teaching is so important, you know, to us. And so it's a shared responsibility, and we feel like you know we should share that responsibility as well. Yeah, I, I would maybe add that one of the interesting things about the partnership is that um, we do have several of the founding partnership members still at the table on the advisory board. Um, certainly the community of SFTR graduates is really robust in San Francisco and so holds, holds that collective memory. Uh, but the majority of now staff and advisory board members are actually new to the partnership. They've come on board sometime along the way. Uh, which sort of speaks to the strength of the original vision of the partnership it was as it was conceived of uh, at the beginning and as it was memorialized in the form of multiple MOUs between the partners. Uh, it's a difficult thing to maintain institutional relationships between three bureaucracies, in this case, and a union. Uh, but this sort of shared vision it, as it was laid out by folks like Carlos Garcia, then the superintendent, Linda Darling-Hammond from Stanford, uh, Peter Williamson, who was uh, then at USF, and is now at Stanford, uh, continues to be involved. Uh, that was really pivotal, I think, to sort of being able to share the vision
innovation as new people come on board. In terms of why we stay on board, and I think everything that everyone has said sort of speaks to that. Um, very clearly, I think that we sort of, um, uh, uh, the, the inflection point in teacher preparation was several years ago. Uh, and that for all of us, this is now probably the single most important priority that we face. It's not only just having a teacher in the classroom, uh, but how we make sure that teachers are well prepared, that they feel that they're entering into a supportive community, and feel that they can make professional commitments both to their schools and their districts for long periods of time. And this perhaps is no different than it's been all along, but the matter of scale, certainly in urban districts, is one that's got our full attention. So uh, we value SFTR, and you can see, in fact, that we've moved lots of resources into expanding the portfolio of teacher preparation options that we can put in front of our community. Um, I think he mentioned also that the parcel tax that we just passed in June, um, the union was you know, a partner in that as well, and we worked really hard to get that parcel tax um, passed. And, and not only did it increase the wages of our teachers, but it also set aside money, like he said, for the program. So we're continuously working, working. Great, thank you. <laughs> and congratulations on that. Uh, getting a parcel tax pass is no easy task. I know. <laughs> Having worked on several myself, yeah. good job. <laughs> uh, so. I want to switch a little bit to, um, we've touched a little bit on the coursework as well as the clinical preparation, but Amy, I wonder if you could talk from your perspective as a resident, what, is that, um, what does that look like for you, how the integration of the coursework as well as the preparation? Yeah, I think because I have the opportunity to be so involved in my students' lives and like in the classroom, the students know who I am then a lot of the things that I'm learning in my Stanford classes, I can directly implement them into my classes. For example, I'm taking adolescent development and I, f I have a case study student who I get to know very well throughout the course of the semester, like through interviews, through shadowing them for a day and also conducting a home visit. And like, I don't think that would be possible if I wasn't so present in the classroom so that the student can trust me and like we can build that relationship. Um, also, I'm taking like curriculum and instruction classes, so like a t class that's teaching me how to teach math. Um, and so a lot of things that we learn, we like diagnostic comments. Um, I'm able to plan a lesson so that I can, like, I can plan a whole activity and then also implement it in the classroom, get it back, leave diagnostic comments, and like see the progress. So like being able to really do things in the classroom. Um, I mean, some of that's like stuff in my Stanford classes, but also in the practicum that we do on Fridays. Uh, we learn a lot of useful things, like I mentioned before, about like warm demander and like what that looks like, how to offer like high support, high expectations, um, and yeah, like a lot of the activities we do is very reflective. Uh, for example, we'll have an, an activity where we think about all of our students. So in my primary class that I teach, I write down every one of my students and like what I know about them to really like get you thinking like, do I really know my students? How how am I like building relationships with them? Um, or even like ha through my inter interactions with the students this week, which ones were positive, which ones were negative, and like really just taking the time to like write those things down, and like that's not something that you get to do on a daily basis unless you have structured time to be like, okay, now take 30 minutes to write about your students, um, and like also like interp interpret your biases, right? And like those are things that you don't have time to reflect on unless there's a space for that. Before you pass the mic off, I wonder if you could also just talk about, we've um, talked a little bit about the funding and the financial support that's provided to residents, and would you mind just adding on from your perspective how, um, what that means to you? Yeah, I think for me, the me joining SFTR wasn't, it was obviously the money, like that's important, but that wasn't like the main thing. I think for me, like knowing that I want to teach in San Francisco and knowing how difficult that it can be to teach in urban settings, um, if there is this residency program that can offer me more support, like why not take that opportunity? Um, so I think going into the program was more just like what I want to get out of it in terms of being prepared to be the best teacher for my students. Um, I think the financial part is like obviously nice because who doesn't appreciate some extra money? Um, <laughs> yeah, so like I'm taking Stanford classes and like my financial aid is enough to just cover like my tuition. Um, so it's really nice to be able to have uh, donors contribute, I think, about 15000 um, just to be able to like have extra money for food and transportation and stuff like that. Um, also, 
following the next two years, we have like a housing stipend that helps us to live in this very unaffordable city. Um, so like that's obviously really great to have extra funding for that. And also in terms of testing, we need to take in California the CSETs and SFTR uh, graciously covers CSET costs and CPR classes. So just a lot of miscellaneous expenses that come with trying to be a teacher. Perfect, thanks. Anna, did you want to add anything else on about the coursework and this integration? Yeah, something that I remember about the program was that being in a classroom every day and having unique students that you're seeing and getting to know makes it so that the way that I saw my classes was like that was a resource. So instead of going to class and like having someone tell you like, oh, you need to read this article for homework and doing it just because it's like expected of you, it was able, it made it so that flip or the script was flipped um, in the sense of like I was going to classes because I was thinking of my students and I was like, I need to go so that I can learn this specific skill because this is what's difficult for me today when I'm actually in my classroom. And so I'm thinking of like what Elaine said of the whole point is the students. And so this program, I feel like it made it possible for it to be student-centered because you're in the classroom and you're seeing those kids every day. And I know I'm walking in and I'm teaching tomorrow. And so either I'm going to walk in and I'm going to feel prepared or I'm going to walk in and I'm going to be like not knowing how to best suit my students' needs. And so I remember that year going into class, my focus was not like, oh, let me just get this done because I need to. It was like, I need to go in and get as much information as I can this year and as much support as I can this year so that I know how to walk in tomorrow and be able to teach the kids and be able to be there for them. Um, and it was, I was thinking about like real students that I was interacting with and um, like specific things that I was really wanting to walk in learning more about. Um, and so that whole experience, it just, yeah, it, there was like a real need for me to learn that information, not just because someone handed me a specific article to read. So I made it so that um, when I went into teaching, I like, I felt like I had gotten more like deeper learning, but then also um, I kind of like knew how to continue driving that learning forward. Um, and like people mentioned, having that support going forward was really essential as well. So knowing that it wasn't like, hey, you have one year, go learn as much as you can and then good luck. Um, but there was that continued support, both from my peers. I think that that cannot be mentioned enough of the fact that you exit the program with a cohort that I still stay in touch with today. And then you go into the district and you're like, oh, we're part of a family. And I walk into district spaces now and I see people from my cohort that are like on posters on the wall. And there's <laughs> kind of like this sweet feeling that's like, oh, that's like one of the people who like I entered this whole district with. So it's a cool sense of accomplishment too. So I want to make sure we give the audience some time to ask questions, but I'm going to ask uh, you all one last question. And Michael, in particular, I'd like to hear from you how you feel the full-year residency prepares teachers to be successful and how, how you view its value as a principal. Oh, that is a whopper. How much time do I have? <laughs> um, do you guys have the rest of the day? Are, you, are we good? Or <laughs> So um, when we think about the nature of schooling, like school is socially reproductive in nature, so the outcomes that we're getting, we are producing those things. Um, and so how do we change that? Because the outcomes that we're receiving right now and getting are not what we want. And the fact that SFTR, they have a social justice focus. So that is something when teachers are actually placed at my school, I do not have to provide a lens of social justice. And it's not that everybody has to have the same definition of perspective around social justice, it's just the fact that you're cued into social justice that means we can actually engage in a dialogue and as a group, as a community, we can co-construct what social justice actually means. So there are implications here for all of the high quality teaching that you hear, the experiences that they're individually receiving, but there are implications. At my school site, they're, prof they're in professional learning communities. So they're in grade level collaborations every Tuesday. Uh, we have professional development. Um, PDs every second and fourth Friday. We have unit planning and looking at student work every first and third Friday. So now we have individuals who are being exposed to these ways of thinking, being exposed to these types of training and holding certain types of conversation, being able to sit back and reflect and think about children. Do I really understand my children so that I can differentiate my knowledge and information? And then now those individuals are now in various spaces in my professional learning community bringing those actual practices. And why is that important for a school like MLK? We have uh, a total of 24 content teachers. Currently, I have seven SFTR teachers who are, fully, who are on my staff full time. And then I have one who is my STEAM coordinator. So I have a total of eight out of 
we've got eight out of 24 people on my campus who are from SFTR. And so if you can think about what you're hearing um, discussed here on the panel between these two participants, imagine I have eight of those individuals who are showing up on my instructional leadership team, they're on my culture club, they're my grade level collaboration. So my professional learning community has taken a completely different conversation and look. What we bring up as questions, what we wrestle with becomes important. And the only thing that I would actually say that was a challenge for me is being able to partner with them uh, at our school site. You have to have a certain number of years of experience in order for them to actually be a resident. And we had such high turnover at my school site that I could never meet the minimum threshold of having somebody three to four years in the, in the practice who I feel is a quality teacher. But we were able to reach that three years ago and <laughs> is just amazing with the work that SFTR is doing. Hey, as a principal, I'm saying this is best thing since sliced bread, or matter of fact, <laughs> yeah, I think well, as a math teacher, it's the best thing since discovering the right angle. So we can build walls. <laughs> right. So SFTR, SFTR. Awesome, that's a perfect way to open it up to um, questions from the audience. So questions? Actually, prin uh, Principal Essien, if you can continue, I was wondering, what are some of the key essential factors that you think are necessary to convert, to set up a teaching school? It sounds like there was like a culture change, and how, what do you think are the factors that are necessary for that? To set up a teacher school? So, um, I was in, as an administrator, I was in the classroom for 21 years before I became assistant principal for two and then the last four years as principal. So I taught Algebra two, Trig, Geometry, and Algebra one, and I also did special education. So coming into the role of a principal, I came in with the definition there are only two things that are important on the campus, students and teachers. So anything else on the campus has to be supporting students and teachers. The principal's not important, the assistant principal's not important, because anything that we do has to be for the support of those teachers. And so setting up systems and structures so that teachers, their time is maximized so that they can actually think and reflect around the work. Because what we do in education is we have made some significant changes in terms of we want from stages on stages to we need to be facilitators of knowledge. Uh, we want people to look at student work. Um, where do you get time to be practice your restorative practice in whole circles? Well, where do teachers get that time for that to happen? Well, it's my job to figure out how to create that space and time so that teachers can actually do that work. So on the teacher culture part, that's my responsibility as an administrator is to find a time so I can continue to support teachers and actually doing their work. Does that answer your question? What are some of those factors that need to be in place for a school to become, go beyond just surviving into thriving and then giving? One, I do believe that uh, we need to begin to see teachers as assets. One of the things that when you see the decline of teachers uh, and teacher residencies, et cetera, I think we've done a very good job of blaming teachers for the problems of education. And so if we're trying to create a teacher culture, you need to see the teachers as assets and look for strengths. These are the things that we ask people to do with our own students. So if it's good for students, it should be good for teachers. Where are the strengths? Because when you find strengths, you can actually build upon those strengths. So asset lens for teachers, but then also um, top down. Uh, like I know a lot of things, but as a person who came out of the classroom, I do understand that regardless of my 21 years in the classroom, if I tell you what you need to do and you have no experience around it, it just becomes compliance and there's no learning. So then how do you create an environment where learning is actually taking place, where we're co-constructing, where if something occurs, uh, this is not a challenge and this is not a gotcha moment, this is a learning moment. When you have failures, when we're failing all over public education. So how do we turn that into an opportunity? Well, why did it fail? What are some things that we can change, some things that we can turn around? And I think that has to come from the top. It has to be the principal, assistant principal, they have to hold that asset lens so the teachers can feel that they can make mistakes and that they can then learn from those mistakes and hold different conversations in professional learning spaces to grow their practices. Great. 
Other questions? Oh, sorry, I Esther, go ahead. One thing I w um, we haven't mentioned that I wanted to mention, when thinking about placements with residents and kind of speaking a little bit to that professional community at the school sites, so our residents are placed in clusters. We're trying to be as intentional as possible when we can about the number of residents we have and then placing them in clusters, which means that we identify school sites like MLK where we have veteran teachers there and then we think about, okay, what are the needs there? And then we place residents like in groups of two to three and in some cases we placed as many as four at one site. Because one, residents are there to support one another. There are carpool opportunities, there are collaborative opportunities, and then it's also a professional learning opportunity for the CTs. So that CTs, our cooperating teachers, can have these kind of conversations that also contribute to retention because they are f professionally being stimulated. And they are thinking about the support systems that exist at, at their school to keep them at their school sites as well. Great, thank you. One, I think we have time for one more question. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask you a little bit. It doesn't sound like your program is um, at this time including special education teachers in the residency model. Um, and I just wondered if you could talk about um, if that's a misunderstanding on my part, please correct me. Um, but if not, what are your thoughts on how to expand your teacher residency program to include um, special education teachers in that? Um, so, so right now, San Francisco teacher residency does not include special education, and this has been one that we've been working hard to figure out. So we have been in exploratory conversations with local university partners about trying to create a residency model. Uh, and in fact, the, the grant application was a good cause to do that. Um, what we learned are a few things. So first, um, uh, typically, especially for mod severe, where we find our greatest shortages, those are usually two-year credentialing programs. Um, so we're talking about doubling the length of a potential re residency, doubling the cost of the residency experience. Uh, and then we're finding that structurally there's a lot of unpacking to do inside of the sort of typical mod severe prep program to be able to match the sort of features of a residency program. So we are just at the earliest stages of figuring out how sort of the residency model can apply to special education but feel that it's very necessary. Um, but don't offer any particular expertise in doing that. What we have done is actually sort of pick up the option of doing alternative credentialing for our special ed teachers. So one of the things that will be true in your district like it is in San Francisco is that we have many highly qualified paraprofessionals for whom the barrier into a teaching credential and the profession is simply too high. Um, so by offering many of these folks an opportunity to work on an intern credential through a supportive program, uh, we've been able to offer about 50 paras per year or so opportunities to work on an intern credential, very often in the same classrooms and settings where they were serving as paras, and then work towards the, the special education credential. It's not an ideal model. I'd prefer to have both operating at the same time, uh, but we have been able to make that step forward while we explore the residency model. I guess my last question um, involves co-teaching. And so I've observed um, in some resident, uh, residency models where it, there is a challenge um, because teachers don't know how to work with each other. Um, even a veteran teacher at times is challenged with, okay, so what do I do with this warm body in my, <laughs> in my classroom? <laughs> um, you briefly mentioned something about co-teaching. Uh, do um, cooperating teachers actually receive formal training in being a co-teacher or co-teaching model? Um, from my perspective, I think that it helps that I went through the program to start and so I was able to experience it from one side and know like what was helpful in that experience. Um, so now that I'm on the other side of it, I can think about being intentional about that. Um, and then I think there also, before I forget, there also are um, like PDs that we go to where we learn about how to be a co-teacher um, we receive information on that, so it's not just expected, like, oh, this person shows up and it's gonna be beautiful, like there's intentional um, coaching around that. Um, and then we also have a supervisor um, that schedules time to come. Um, so Amy has supervisory every week, but then that person also comes in and does observations. So we're working together every day, but there's a third party that's coming in um, to also observe and then give feedback. Um, that includes feedback to both of us. Um, but I also think that it's worth mentioning that I think the school culture also plays into that. And so at MLK, there is this 
culture that we're all working together within the school building. And so for me, it doesn't feel like it's something new that there's another adult in my room. Um, that's something that I've experienced the entire way of um, there's been like special education teachers that have been in the same room as me that I've been co-teaching with. Um, there's been, like from day one, uh, Mr. Essien has said that he's a thought partner that anytime I want more feedback, he can come in and then um, we can talk together about like whatever's going on in my classroom. So I think that the school itself also needs to be thoughtful about just how are we setting up, how do people typically work together in this building? Does that lend itself to co-teaching and people feeling comfortable working together? Or is that something that's very foreign? Because I think if teachers are used to like being just in their room with a closed door and this is my space and I'm the only person in there, then having someone else in that room is probably gonna feel very different. Um, and I think there's a bigger barrier to that. Um, so I think that, yeah, I think it starts off with where's the school already? Where is that teacher coming from? What was their experience? Um, and then I think that how um, the residency program actually coaches those people, those all play together to make it successful. Perfect. I want to thank the panel. Can we thank the panel?